Welcome to the ETF Market Insights, your regular webinar series that focuses on the evolving world of ETF investing. Each Friday, a new panel of thought leaders aims to provide investment education and insights with the goal of helping you become an informed investor. Make sure to visit www.youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights to watch previous episodes and remember to hit subscribe so you receive a notification when we post new content. Thank you for joining us today. Let's get started. Good afternoon. I'm Danielle Nuzzel from BMO Exchange Traded Funds. It's so great to have you back join us on ETF Market Insights, whether you're joining live this Friday afternoon or tuning in on demand on our YouTube channel. It's always so great to have you with us. Before we get started, if you've joined us before, you know the drill here. Today, we're not providing any recommendations. We're not giving you any advice. Today's sole purpose is to provide information around financial markets with a focus on ETFs, really trying to give investors all the tools they need and the information that's relevant to them to navigate markets and monitor their own portfolios. We have Chris Heeks, Director and Portfolio Manager here from BMO joining us again today. It's so great to have Chris back. We're talking about smoothing out the ride today, a couple different factor strategies if you're looking to mitigate volatility in your portfolio. And while we're seeing a lot of volatility in the market, picking up more and more throughout the year, so a really relevant conversation today. So for our one minute ETF update, I found this chart on Bloomberg. So today we're talking about volatility in the markets. And what we tend to see when volatility picks up is that ETF trading picks up, but also ETFs as a percentage of the entire exchange volume tends to pick up as well. Now this is looking at the US market, but we see this trend in Canada also. And what this really shows us is that ETFs are used by investors when markets are whipsawing and moving quickly to get in and out of positions tactically, efficiently, and with liquidity. So another really good proof point for ETFs in volatile markets. So Chris, when, when I put this slide together earlier this week, I was thinking about what's causing market volatility to pick up uh, in 2022. Of course, central banks planning on increasing interest rates and rising inflation, two big topics. But what we're really seeing now is that um, geopolitical risk, not now, not just brewing, but it's it's here. We're seeing, um, you know, Russia now has officially invaded the Ukraine, and markets are digesting this. Can you maybe give us a view of, you know, Thursday morning when you show up to work and you log in from, from your portfolio management perspective? how the market started digesting this uh, massive storyline? Uh, for sure, Danielle, and uh, good afternoon. It's great great to be back once again. Um, yeah, Thursday morning, it was certainly volatility uh, was, was very present. Um, you know, broad markets in, in Europe were down four to 5%, you know, US and Canada's down two to 3%. Um, kind of rallied back off those lows, but, you know, if you look at Russia, Russian stocks are down about 40% uh, on Thursday. So, um, you know, you know, very, you know, very obvious volatility. And, you know, as you mentioned, I think those three things, I think it's great what you mentioned, though, they're, they're things that we haven't really dealt with in a long time. Uh, rising interest rates is something we haven't had in several years. Um, inflation, we're at, I believe it's a 40 year high in terms of where we are in inflation. And we really haven't had this level of geopolitical risk with this. Not sure whether to call it a, a war yet, but it certainly sounds like one, doesn't it? So, you know, with 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 you know an outright war, I mean, there's there's a lot of risk in the market. So, you know, I, I think you know, looking forward to the conversation and that ways investors can, um, you know, reduce and mitigate some of the volatility and still achieve their outcomes, um, you know, by by investing, um, you know, with slightly different strategies in these markets. You made a great point there that there are these three bullets here on the slide are, are some th things that in most investors or many investors have not had to deal with um, in their investment careers. So certainly um, trying to learn how to navigate rising inflation, rising rates, and then all of this geopolitical risk 
uh, very top of mind for investors. So Chris, when we talk about volatility in the markets, uh, one of the most widely cited uh, reference points is the VIX, so the CBOE Volatility Index. Can you maybe just explain to some um, investors out there who may, might not be familiar with what the VIX is, explain to them how this shows them how volatile markets uh, can be? Yeah, definitely. So, you, yeah, I think we, we hear about, you know, people talking about the VIX and it's a, um, it's, it's not a measure of historical risk. It, what it is, it's a measure of forward looking risk. It's essentially how investors, you know, are feeling about the market. And, and just to give a little background on what it is so we can all educate ourselves, it's derived from option pricing. So what, what the, 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 the way they get to this number, the VIX, which right now is in the mid thirties, they look at prices of options and depending on those prices they'll say okay the one month forward volatility is 35 percent so that's where it is today now if you look at this graph you can see during covid uh the vix actually shot up to an, an all-time high um so it's not always a one for one with with actual risk in portfolios but it's a good barometer that you hear about a lot in terms of just giving an overall assessment um so, so um, yeah, I mean, certainly the VIX is, is elevated. You can see even as it's come off that peak of COVID, it's kind of remained somewhat elevated relative to, um, you know, the average level pre-COVID. If you go back a few years, even into 2016, 17, the VIX was in the single digits, so below that 10 line. So um, increased volatility, increased spikes in volatility, um in this kind of post-covid world um has, has been here and it's something you know unfortunately it looks like you know 2022 is gonna there's gonna be you know probably a higher vix than the historical average of you know the historical average is 15 i think we're probably going to be staying north of 15 this year all right almost double that historical average if we're looking in the mid 30s right now so certainly a lot more volatility for investors um, to be working with and be facing right now a couple other key terms that I think are very important for investors to understand when they're trying to understand volatility in the markets and understand lower volatility strategies are beta and standard deviation. Chris, can you just walk us through these two uh, key terms and tell them why they're an, the important characteristics for investors to look at when evaluating stocks or ETFs? Yeah, for sure. So beta is a market relative metric. Uh, the market by definition would have a beta of one. And then what you can do is you can calculate the beta of, of all the stocks within, within the index or within the market. And the beta is a measure of roughly how it moves with the market. So a beta uh, for, so for a stock, for example, with a beta of one, it's gonna move roughly in line with the market. Now, obviously individual stocks are gonna have individual factors and events that affect them but it's on average, it's moving one-to-one -one with the market. Um, you know, in our low volatility portfolios where we do use beta as a metric, we're looking for stocks with less sensitivity to the, to the market. So stocks with a 0.3 beta, 0.5 beta, 0.7 beta. So stocks that are less variable in comparison to the market. And then on the other hand, the type of stocks that were, you know, you generally don't see invested in low volatility strategies, higher beta stocks, you know, these would be your, uh, Shopify's, you know, your high risk energy explorers, you know, higher risk stock stocks with, they're going to have a beta of two or even three. Um, and standard deviation, that that term is is a not a market relative uh, term. So that's just calculate the standard deviation. You just look at the price history of the stock you're looking at. And it's just a statistical measure of how much that stock varies from day to day. So it doesn't really, you don't really look at the market or what the market's doing, you just look at the standard deviation uh, of, of the stock. Now the two measures are pretty related, but depending on which approach you know you use in, in uh, some of these low ball strategies, you'll see different results in the end portfolio. Thanks, Chris. And for an example, standard deviation uh, is actually used as an input for risk ratings on ETFs. So if you're ever looking up uh, an ETF on a provider's website and you see that risk rating, that's actually derived from the standard deviation. So a higher standard deviation gives that ETF a higher risk rating, a lower standard deviation provides a lower risk rating for the ETF. Now, ETFs actually in general are 
quite good tools to mitigate portfolio volatility. And this is for a few reasons, but one of them is because they provide uh, more diversification than a single stock. So a basket of stocks would be much less or more or less volatile than a single stock would. And what I did, I put pulled some returns. So January 2022, we saw volatility start to pick up. I used the Canadian market as an example to really illustrate this point. So I pulled the, um, the largest companies in Canada here showing their January returns. And you can see very big swings, some to the upside and some to the downside. Remember, upside swings are also add into volatility as much as downside swings. But when you look at the ETF return over the same period, and this ETF does hold all these stocks, actually it's the 240 largest uh, publicly listed companies in Canada, you can see that much less volatility with that return, just negative 40 basis points. So almost flat versus some of these other names that had some pretty big swings in January. So ETFs in general tend to provide less volatility than stocks do. But as we dive deeper, there are ETF strategies that provide even are made to provide less volatility or to help mitigate volatility. Chris, we talk a lot about factor investing. So today we're gonna highlight the two factors which can do this. Can you just briefly introduce these factors to the audience that might have not um, heard of them before? For sure, and that, you know, just to take a step back, uh, factor investing is when you have an approach to the market, but Differ it from the market cap weighting. Um, so there's different factors. MSCI has identified six of them. I think these are the six standard ones that we think about. Some are less risky, some are more risky. Um, so right here on this chart, you know, we have them laid out in that kind of general order of risk. Your lowest one would be the low volatility, where you're specifically target, targeting more defensive, more lower risk stocks. Um, dividends would be next up that chain, uh, where where and 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 we should put the emphasis on sustainable dividend growers because not all dividend stocks are sustainable dividend stocks there there is a bit of a difference there the unsustainable dividend stocks would actually be on the the right side of the you know on the more risky side but for sustainable div dividend growers another good way to ride out the market volatility um also doing quite well this year i'd add and then you know quality we won't touch on too much today i think but um you know just another one that's a little bit less risky than the broad beta so when we're thinking about mitigating volatility through a factor approach, you know, low volatility and dividends, I think are, are, are going to be two good places to think about and, and, you know, to a lesser extent quality as well. Thanks, Chris. So maybe we can start with low volatility. So there's a few low volatility strategies out there um, in ETFs listed in Canada. So investors have a bit to sort through if this is something they, they're looking at or want to research more about. What considerations can an investor make when trying to educate themselves on a low volatility strategy or trying to pick which low volatility strategy might be best suited for them? Oh, I think that I think the first thing to think about, and, and you you touched on it, right, is there's there's a lot of low volatility strategies out there. So the first thing to realize is, you know, just because something says low volatility um, doesn't mean they're all the same as everybody else's, right? So um, all those decisions um, that are made along the line, and, and not even every low volatility uh, strategy follows a disciplined uh, decision-making process like the BMOs ones, but you'll see all those decision-making process, you know, if you're using standard deviation or beta, um, are portfolios being optimized? And if they are, what kind of constraints are in the portfolios? Um, are you including other factors as well? You know, I think the, I think the, the big thing to look at is, you know, um, as investors, you want to understand what you're investing in. You know, so for example, we have white papers on our website, and 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 Danielle on our, you know, the, the Market Insights website. So we we try to communicate this is what you're getting, but yeah, it's something to to take uh, under consideration that you know all those little decisions that might seem like the little decisions. You know, do we cap sectors to make sure we don't get overexposure to one sector? You know, all those little kind of they almost sound like minor points, but they can actually have a Pretty big impact on what the portfolio looks like and pretty big impact on what the uh you know results you get out of those portfolios so something to keep in mind as as uh, investors are shopping around for the best strategies 
Great, thanks, Chris. And maybe just I'll, I'll highlight uh, when when investors are looking through these right white papers and doing their research, just just those considerations: is the ETF looking at beta or is it looking at standard deviation? How is it weighting um, those low volatility stocks? And are there any other factors being considered? Is it just low volatility or is it being con um, being used with another factor? We call these multi-factors. And when you're looking at those beta or standard deviation numbers, another thing I really uh, encourage investors to look at is, is it a one-year beta? Is it a three-year beta? Is it a five-year beta? Because we usually see uh, longer time periods have more sustainable um, characteristics or it can tell us more if that stock truly is a low volatility stock versus just looking at a one-year number. So a few things just to keep in mind. So kind of going down this path, Chris, so you you know, you said there are a lot of different different options out there for investors. Certainly, if we look at returns here, um, they don't all uh, go go side by side. What types of things affect the different different low volatility strategies and the, why the performance can be so different? Yeah, so just to kind of describe the chart here, you can see the blue line is the broad beta index, the S and P T S X composite. And we've got three low vol strategies, the BMO in orange, the Invesco in green, and the uh, iShares in purple. Um, you know, the first thing I'd say about low volatility investing in general is because, you know, and, and this goes across all the strategies, you know, be, because you invest in uh, more defensive stocks, you tend to be in more defensive sectors. So you tend, you know, say, for example, in Canada, energy and materials are, um, some of the most high flying high beta sectors you tend to have underweights to those sectors you have more weight to more defensive stocks such as consumer staples uh, utilities some real estate um, so that's that's a general comment but you know in this five-year time horizon uh, that we're looking back with this chart and, and and you can see the further returns since inceptions as well um, it doesn't, you know, the nice thing is it doesn't, you know, just because you're taking a little less risk doesn't mean you're always sacrificing on return. And you can see even in a one year market where uh, that return on the index is up 25, uh, almost 25%, you know, the BMO strategy is up 24, you know, the invest goes up 10. Um, so that's a big difference. Again, it all comes down to the portfolio construction and you want to, you know, I think as an investor, you want a nice understandable process that's repeatable and disciplined through time. I think that's a good way to approach it. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so uh, results will, will definitely vary. Uh, you know, we've been fortunate to have an award winning um, solution in the space in, in Canada in particular. Um, and it's a little hard to see on this graph, but uh, because ZLB was, the BMO one was outperforming so much pre-COVID, you can see it got well ahead uh, of the market so that when that drawdown happened, you know, it's also going down less than the broad market during the COVID drawdown. It just puts you in a better place to succeed. So that's another thing you see with low volatility is a lot of it's winning by not losing. So when the market has those big market risk off events and we're having you know, we're having some risk off at the end of this week, right, with Ukraine, you know, that low volatility strategies, you want them, you expect them not to go down as much as the, as the broad market, you know, and indeed that's what they're doing, and it puts them in a better place to succeed kind of going forward. So um, that's the whole, um, you know, attraction behind it, and and as you can see, it's developed, it's, you know, we've got a long track record over 10 years for ours, it's delivering some pretty compelling returns over time with less risk as well versus the broad market. I love that winning by not losing. It's a great tagline for low volatility strategies. And right here on this chart, you can you can see that exactly happening um, during that onslaught of, of the COVID news and in March and April of 20, 2020, you can see the, the blue line, which is the broad market, dips the lowest and the, the low volatility strategies don't lose as much during that time. So a great visual to um, illustrate that. Now, Chris, if we look at a low volatility ETF, if we look at its portfolio versus a broad market exposure, there are a lot of notable differences. Could you talk us through those? For sure. So, um, 
So this again is Canada, looking at broad Canada versus ZLB. You know, the biggest difference is uh, energy and materials, like I said. So you know, if you look at Canada now, energy materials, well, they're adding up to, looks like about 26%. You know, in the past, that number was actually quite a bit higher, closer to 40, I believe, uh, when we launched ZLB. Uh, but ZLB, in terms of energy, actually has no energy. And believe it or not, it's still keeping up with market returns, despite not having any energy. And energy has done well the past uh, 12 months. Uh, there's only an 8% weight in materials. So underweight energy and materials, those are your most cyclical sectors. You're going you're gonna to generally see underweights in your low volatility there. Um, there's also an underweight to financials. Um, uh, you know, the banks often are the beta in Canada. So ZLB owns banks, but typically holds them with a little less weight than the broad index. Um, where you see kind of those overweights, and you can kind of see it in the top 10 here. If you just take a look and get a sense of these top names, uh, Hydro One is a utility. Franco Nevada is a gold uh, royalty corporation. So one of the few materials in the fund, but then you see Metro uh, grocers, there's there's a couple of grocers there, Metro, Empire, and blah, blah. Just, you know, very, you know, sometimes low volatility stocks are accused of being boring. Uh, but the nice thing, Danielle, is boring doesn't mean not good because the boring stocks tend to give really strong performance over time. Kind of that slow and steady wins the race. So you can see in that top 10, you know, grocers, utilities, some telecom, it's a very differentiated exposure. Um, and again, it's just really designed to benefit by winning by not losing when the markets go down and then just being kind of slow and steady on the upside. So a great way to mitigate um, some of this volatility that we're, we're seeing and, and we you know think may continue as we move through the year. So Chris, the second factor strategy we wanna spend some time talking about today that can help mitigate volatility our dividend ETFs. And I know you highlighted sustainable dividends being very important. And we're telling investors, again, look under the hood when you're looking at different dividend strategies to make sure they are sustainable. What other considerations can investors make if they're thinking about uh, a dividend ETF to add to a portfolio? Yeah, so again, um, dividend ETFs are on that less risky side over to, you know over time when we look at the versus the broad benchmark. Now, I think we, we we we're touching on, and I think it's very very important with dividends is some dividend companies are stable, generating good cash flow, paying it out sustainably. That's what we generally want to invest in. Also, companies that are growing the dividend over time is associated with good return. On the other hand, what you want to avoid in the dividend space and what's actually going to increase your risk and not decrease it is you know, companies that are have an unstable business model that are paying out unsustainably and you know risking cut, cutting that dividend. So unfortunately, as investors, we all, you know, I think are naturally attracted to stocks with the high, higher dividend yields. But when you start seeing those dividend yields really high, generally in that six, seven, eight, ten percent range, it's a good indication that a cut's coming. So with dividend investing, I think you want to be also thinking about investing with a bit of a quality bias. So you want to invest with good blue chip companies. Um, dividend growth is great. Dividend sustainability. So if you look at payout ratios of those dividends, you know, if a company is making a hundred dollars, well, a hundred, let's make it a hundred million, just making a hundred million, but paying out 200 millions of dividends, obviously that's not sustainable. So those are the types of things that we look at. And again, you know, we, as we kind of highlight the slide here, look underneath the hood because not every dividend strategy is the same. Some dividend strategies will go for those very risky uh, high dividend yields. But again, I think what proves out performance over time is sustainable dividends. And so that's really the focus of our methodology. Yeah, I think a lot of investors uh, who are di dividend investors are looking at that um, the dividend, the annualized distribution yield of an ETF or seeing what that dividend yield is and thinking that's enough due diligence and just picking the highest uh, yielding dividend ETF or, or stock. And you make just such a great point that you really need, need to dig deeper and understand is that dividend sustainable? Will that company be able to pay that, that same rate out over time? Will they be able to grow it? 
um, all those things are really important to look at. So now just comparing portfolios, Chris. So again, let's look at the broad Canadian market versus um, a, divid a Canadian dividend portfolio. Can you tell us how uh, these look a little different? Yeah, so relative to, to the low vol, the dividends often look a little bit more like uh, the broad index. Um, so you'll see that higher financials weight. You know, there's always a great source of dividend yield in financials. Um, the banks in particular stand out. You know, as we know, the banks raised their dividends significantly last November. Um, just kicking off earnings as we as we you know go to go go to market with this webinar, but you know continued strong performance and probably you know some more dividend growth out of the banks you know as we move through the year. Um, energy is a good source of dividend yield. So while some energy companies have carry more risk, um, they can carry um, attractive yields. And we're seeing with oil prices higher, um, some of these companies are making very uh, attractive cash flows right now. Um, so there's some good dividend growers and dividend payers in the energy space. And, and as you can see on the top 10, Enbridge sticks out on the number four there after, after the three banks. You know, you'll see very, in our strategy, we also look at uh, the market cap times the dividend. So we look at the total dividend. So, you know, if you look at the top 10, again, you want to invest in blue chip dividend payers, I think is your best kind of, uh, what I think is, is, a, is a very solid way to look at dividend investing over long periods. And again, so our top, top 10 of our dividend mandate really in those blue chip, big um, Canadian companies. And, um, and, and, and yeah, and, and you know, I think there's a couple other reasons to look at dividends, you know, and, and, and we, we don't have time to go into a full market overview, but obviously people trying to generate yield, dividends are very effective. That's, I think, pretty obvious, but with fixed income, with lower yields, dividends are that much more attractive. And the other thing is, quite frankly, you, you know, Danielle, did, did, dividends didn't perform too well in 2020, but they staged a pretty good comeback in 2021. And that comeback is accelerating. So with rising interest rates, dividends are actually a strategy that historically has done well in periods of rising interest rates. So kind of excited from a market dynamic perspective as well that these dividends can kind of have that ability to potentially outperform this year. So and that's just another thing we're looking at. But again, these are constructed to be good, well-rounded portfolios, increase the yield and, and really target those blue chip um, you know, bread and butter, Canadian or, or US or EFI companies, as the case may be. Great, thanks, Chris. And I did pull the two di di distribution yields, uh, put them on the slide just for an illustrative point to show that yield bump in a dividend portfolio versus broad market. Just remember those yields are as of the middle of February. So if you would like an up-to-date number, just visit bmoetfs.com and we update that distribution uh, yield every week. So you're getting a current yield number there. So if you're thinking about uh, you know, adding a factory ETF to your portfolio and thinking about something that mitigates volatility, we, Chris, thanks so much. You gave us two really, really good um, ideas today. So low volatility ETFs, again, designed to select or to screen for the lower volatility stocks within an index. Dividend ETFs are screened to provide more dividend income, but are also a factor that is closer to the lower risk side of the spectrum and when we think about all the factors. So two really good strategies. Um, and thanks, Chris, again, for talking us through those. So if you're looking to pick an, an ETF or want to learn more about it, we have our BMO ETF roadmap. It's right on ETFmarketinsights.com. I know there's a lot to sort through, but what this roadmap does is it gives you a really good visual going through each region you can see the dividend strategy or the low volatility strategy that BMO offers for each region. So just a nice and kind of a nice tool to search for different strategies if it's something you'd like to research more about. We're saving time for some questions. We did get a few. Um, so let's get to those right away. Chris, the first question comes in. It's a question about premium and discount on ETF. So what is that? And is this necessarily a bad thing? Should we be avoiding ETFs that have premiums or discounts? Yeah, great question. And uh, I'll apologize in advance. It, could, it could, could be a bit of a complicated answer, but let me give it a try. So what is it? So 
premium discount looks at the difference between the last traded price of an ETF and the NAV of the ETF. Uh, so generally expecting, generally we expect ETFs to trade in line with the NAV. So the question is, is, is rightly observing, well, if I see a larger premium or discount, so premium would be the last traded prices above the NAV, discount means the last traded price is below the NAV. You know, great question, why would it happen? And, and you know, is it a problem? Um, again, this could be a little bit complicated. There's a couple different reasons why you can have premium and uh, discounts. Uh, the first one is valuation. Um, so BMO, I would say our NAVs are struck with uh, a 4 p.m. valuation. So, so when we're valuing NAVs at the end of the day, the close of the market is 4 p.m. You know, we use 4 p.m. closing prices to the best of our ability. We use 4 p.m. FX rates to the best of our ability. Um, international securities that close earlier in the day, we create a fair value price. So we try and keep that NAV right close to where we think that 4 p.m. value is. Not all ETF providers follow that same methodology. Some use older prices in, in the calculation of the NAV. Now, obviously that can, that can create a difference between your end of day value and what the NAV gets calculated at. So first thing is, is calculation. Um, another thing that happens with some ETFs is uh, stale pricing. So for example, if the last trade of price of an ETF is at 2 p.m., that's the last trade for that day, and the market goes on to evolve throughout the day, that NAV at 4 p.m. is going to end up at a different level. And, and so, you know, you might see a difference between the two. Um, so, you know, generally speaking, as the ETF markets evolve, most products trade, you know, fairly frequently. But sometimes you still see with ETFs that maybe newer ETFs, that they don't have that trade really close to the end of the day. So you can see a little bit of differential there. Um, is that something to be avoided? No, it's not necessarily a problem. I mean, just because an ETF doesn't have a lot of volume on a day, as we know, doesn't mean it's not liquid or not able to be traded. Um, the liquidity of an ETF is going to derive from the liquidity of, of the underlying. And, you know, the other thing just to tie into that stale pricing is, you know, when you have markets with high volatility, it's likely you're going to see, you know, a little bit bigger premiums and discounts. Because um, let's say, you know, as we go into the close, if the market's really moving around, maybe the last trade on that ETF is at 359 a minute before the close. But in that last minute, maybe the market moves a percent. So you could still have that 1% premium discount. So there's a few different reasons. I would say overall, it's not something that ETF investors need to be worried about um, for a few reasons. Um, number one, and I'll speak to our, our, our lineup, Danielle, um, we have multiple market makers on our products, on all of our products. And the reason that's good is because if someone's pricing an ETF a little bit out of line where its true value is, then the other market makers, you know, having competitive market makers can help keep that in line. We have very strong relationships with all the market makers in Canada. So that helps the ETF trade near NAV. The other thing that's a big help in the ETF space is we have daily liquidity for the market makers. So they can create ETFs, they can redeem ETFs on a daily basis. So unlike, uh, say, for example, closed end funds, this can become a real big problem, premium and discounts, because they can become 10, 20, 30%. We've seen it with some of the Bitcoin ETFs, uh, or sorry, Bitcoin closed end funds, I should say. Uh, but with an ETF, because there's daily liquidity, it's much, much less of an issue. So typically premium and discounts are running at, at much, much lower levels than closed end funds. So, you know, I apologize if it's a bit of a, a bit of a complicated answer. I really do apologize, but it's not something, you know, at least on our lineup, I think you have to worry too much about you know, I think the big investor protection there is having a having a um, you know really robust market making um, you know ecosystem, having multiple market makers, a lot of different um, you know people in the market, and that helps keep those ETFs trading very close to now. So I, I hope that helps answer the question. A great explanation, thanks, Chris. And maybe I'll just back it up just to tell investors who might be new to the term premium and discount. This is unique to an ETF because it has a market price. So that price does move throughout the day when markets are open. Reminder that something like a mutual fund that doesn't trade uh, throughout the day is that net asset value, that NAV price, and it doesn't have a market price. So thanks for walking us through that. 
Uh, next question that comes in here. Oh, we have someone asking about the trucker convoy situation here in Canada. Are there some sectors that are going to be uh, really impacted by this, Chris? Yeah, not not so much. I think you know, it's most investors are looking at you know what your earnings on a you know what are the earnings going to be this year, next year, and you know to be honest, a lot of the value of these stocks is their ongoing kind of business throughout the next future decades. Um, so you know. Um, you know, I think the most concerning thing with the trucker convoy was that was the blockade aspect, and obviously the borders being blocked is not good for business, um, not good for free flow of goods. But you know, still for most investors, relatively short-lived. Um, you know, one thing I'll just I would note here is that I found interesting looking at some data is is, is inventories of autos uh, are at are at very uh, low levels right now. So I think a lot of consumers are experiencing that. The trucker convoy certainly didn't help that when a lot of, you know, as we know, auto manufacturing depends on that cross-border travel. So just an interesting side point. Um, but yeah, not not a big issue for investors. Obviously, you know, the geopolitical risk is front and center right now. Um, I just think the interest rates going up as well is, is something to think about and position for as you think about, um, you know, how that's going to impact uh, markets so I, I think stick to those bigger themes but uh, yeah hopefully that helps answer that one as well thanks Chris last question we have an investor asking about uh, management expense ratios MERs for ETS which are fund of funds so how are these MERs calculated I can speak for BMO so all our ETFs that are fund of funds like our asset allocation ETFs that hold other ETFs the MER you see on that the ETF is all you're paying. There's no double dipping. There's no second layer of management fees for the underlying holdings. But I will caution investors, I'm speaking on FEMO's behalf. This, this is general industry practice. However, always, always do your due diligence. Read the prospectus of the ETF you're investing in. That prospectus will tell you exactly how the fees are structured for that product. But for BMO, if you do buy a fund to fund ETF, it's just the, the one management fee uh, right on the front of that ETF that you're paying. So thanks for that question. That's it for us today. Thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to watch any of uh, our content on demand, please check out our YouTube channel. We had a great uh, January and early February of, of different types of sessions, different topics. Please check them out if you'd like to go back and watch them. They're there for you. Uh, next Friday, we are going to dive deep into what this war in the Ukraine means in terms of our portfolios and our ETFs. What's it doing to markets? We're going to do uh, have a big conversation on this to give you all the information you need to think about your portfolios and how it might be impacted by this. So please tune in next Friday at one o'clock for that discussion. Thanks for tuning in today and we'll see you next week. Thank you for watching the Market Insights webinar series. To stream any previous episode of the Market Insights webinar series, please visit www.youtube.com slash ETF Market Insights. Remember to hit subscribe so you know when we post new content. Also, we invite you to visit our accompanying website for ETF tools, education, and much more at www.etfmarketinsights.com. Once again, thank you for watching. The session provided is for information purposes only. Any reference to a particular company or product is for illustrative purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell. Particular investments and or trading strategies should be evaluated relative to the individual's investment objectives and professional advice should be obtained with respect to any circumstance.